the 15th of June, 2022. I'm your host, Dana Durmford. We got a a, um, dive off, a die off show ready for everybody tonight. So, what we look at is the radioactive fallout worldwide. And we look at die-offs that could be contributed to Fukushima Daiichi nuclear meltdowns. This was four reactors that had melted down. You can call in at 709-589-4406. It always takes a moment or two to get these difficult shows up and running. I hope everybody had a great day. Consider subscribing, liking, click the notification bell. A lot of people get unsubscribed over the years, we've noticed. And what we're going to teach you about is not rocket science. You don't need an education in nuclear to understand the subject. If you can make it through the show, what you'll find out is you'll be incredibly prepared for this conversation and you won't be living an illusion. We got a poll for everyone tonight to help articulate the show. Has Fukushima Global Radioactive Follow permanently compromised the ability of species to exist. And my bit rate should be around 7,000, so that's not a good sign. We got fiber optics, <clears throat> and so it's very difficult to understand how my bandwidth can disappear <laughs> like that. So this model is the Norwegian Institute for Air Research after Fukushima. And it shows um, continuous plume covering the planet at 480, 68 hours. This is 19.5 days in the bottom right-hand corner. The fallout is from multiple reactors that had melted down. This is just two of them. But to kind of give you some context, there was four of them and eight fuel pools. The yeah, mainstream media is actually pretending they're in the fuel pools of Reactor 4 in that depiction. There's uh, media worldwide has perpetrated that deception. Uh, they done the same thing in 2020 for Reactor 3. And the fuel pools at the very top of the building, you see two depictions, there's two fuel pools at the top of the buildings. This is completely different than Chernobyl. Chernobyl was a new reactor <clears throat> it was mostly graphite, and these are pure uranium plutonium. One was a uh, mixed oxide fuel. So when you see a headline that says doomsday light radiation released a fire in the pool, which they're alluding to as the fuel pool at reactor four, would be a global catastrophe, a global catastrophe. That's Reactor 3 blowing up, by the way. And you can see the plume model in your bottom uh, depiction is April the 7th. That's uh, 27 days later. The entire planet, the entire planet is covered in a continuous plume of radioactive fallout. So when you talk about doomsday-like radiation, that's what you're looking at. And this is what actually happened to us. And this is why they pretend that they're in the building to the left, 100 feet above the wreckage. They've done the same thing with Reactor 3. They're currently planning to do the same thing with Reactor 2 and Reactor 1. But when they level out Reactor 3 and 4, with the homeless and the destitute and the victims of society and immigrants don't speak the language because nuclear scientists will never tread there, you can see there's only stumps of these 19-story, 65-meter, 195-foot-tall buildings. 
Germany produced models of radioactive fallout among many, many countries. Maybe worse than thought. Uh, studies from last year indicate that radioactive water will contaminate the entire Pacific Ocean in just six years. Kim Minji reports. This graphic shows the gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German marine research institute, shows the entire Pacific water is being polluted by radioactive water in just six years. Maybe worse. And officially, they came out with a depiction to your left from NOAA, which is the tsunami, but they called it the radioactive emissions. And then they came out and made fun of you when you believed it. But the actual NOAA model of the emissions specifically into the ocean itself is to the right. And so it was very dishonest what they'd done. This was a model from Japan based upon, it's actually based upon nine days of fallout after the last explosion. It's based on a total of 16 days, and so in 16 days you can see the radiation is covering the entire planet. What we done was we launched research expeditions, and we covered the entire coast of the west coast of the North America from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Alaska. We done that year after year for six years, and multiple times a year, and that's some of the boats. That I was using. Well, we got the big one up. And what we discovered, to our absolute horror, was an extinction level event. This is a extinction level event. That's the only way to describe Fukushima. And we have we have meandered through the entire coastline for year after year after year. And this is your typical weather, just to give you some context of who I am and what was done, why we're talking about this particular narrative. And so the species to your left didn't, were exterminated and did not come back. And we know this because we repeated the research year after year. And as you can see, species to your left have not returned. The, but the diversity was exterminated, basically. And there was this incredible diversity to your left, you can see. And that is now permanently exterminated. These are authentic before and after pictures from the coastline of British Columbia. And this would mimic uh, the west coast of North America. <clears throat> and this is uh, true everywhere else is what we've discovered, in other words. So the species to your left no longer exist. We know this, this is unassailable documentation because we've done the research year after year after year. So I've been demonized and vilified and marginalized and, as you can see, censored heavily into non-existence, basically, so that you might not understand the story. You might say, well, he's got, he's only got uh, 13 viewers on his show. He's not worth looking at, right? That's what their intentions are. They took down my last site with 24,000 subscribers when we were looking for spiders. Uh, this is a very, very uh, terrible story, really. This is a uh, farmer harvesting food alongside a one-ton bags of radiation, thousands of them, in a nuclear wasteland surrounded by nuclear wastelands. So Fukushima Prefecture is one of the 14 prefectures that was banned by 55 countries worldwide. So think about that statement, and it's a good thing they did because in the first year in Japan, there was over 865,000 extra cancers. Cancer is just one of 1,800 diseases and illnesses and autoimmune deficiencies and injuries that will manifest. Uh, this is a staggering number. Not everybody in Japan has health care, and not everybody was diagnosed in that first year. Not everybody would have just had cancer. 
This is a model of the plutonium-239 dispersals from TEPCO's numbers. So we're, we're going to run from here on. We're just going to run through stories that we gathered up over the last 30 days since the last presentation on the subject. But I wanted to give you a quick buffer if you're not familiar with this subject so you would have context. And I'll go back uh, to whales won't stop killing themselves in New Zealand. The media now likes, because it's happening so much, the media says it's normal, but it's actually not normal. And that kind of headline will give you some context where wheels, wheels, whales won't stop killing themselves in New Zealand. There was a mink whale unusual mortality event for the Atlantic Ocean, the Atlantic. Remember, Fukushima's on the Pacific. There was a gray whale and still is unusual mortality for the West Coast, which is the Pacific. There is a, also a humpback whale unusual mortality event since 2016, still ongoing, where they're showing, all these whales are showing up. The one thing they all have in common is they're showing up emaciated. And that's in the Atlantic Ocean, remember? That's the Atlantic, and uh, the mink whales is the Atlantic, the humpback whales is the Atlantic, so this is not, as you can see, by the radioactive fallout. It's not just a Pacific thing. There's a uh, right whale unusual mortality event for the North Atlantic also. Uh, we've got documentations of uh, killer whales showing up emaciated since, Fuku since uh, several years after Fukushima. One of the theories is they have leukemia. And this was predicted that within 10 years, you would have 1,000 becquels a kilogram. And that means you're going to be producing so many white blood cells, they actually have leukemia. The whales, the killer whales are showing up because they can eat over 300 different species. They don't just eat, like some whales specialize in krill or phytoplankton and stuff like that. These are like lions. They eat every species out there. The adult is shown the condition known as peanut head, which indicates a significant loss of fat blubber around the head. But it's... It means they're emaciated. The seabird die-offs have been extraordinary. Now they're trying to blame it on so-called bird flu. We'll, we'll get to that later. And what we've seen was millions <coughs> of common MERS, for instance, showing up emaciated. And the common MERS, can, and this is in Alaska, the common MERS, and northern Canada. The common mer, and we now see it on the east coast in the Atlantic, but the common mers will dive 600 feet all day and feed on anchovies, squid, sardines, capelin, small 8, 9, 10 inch fish, right? So when they show up emaciated, because they can cover long distances and they can dive in great depths all day without any effort, then that's That's a uh, very worrisome. Officials recorded deaths of forktail storm petros, full mars, shearwaters, kitty wakes, oclets, the Cassini oclets, and puffins. The Cassini oclets, uh, they found over a million of them dead when I was on the research expedition on the West Coast. And uh, they, at the same time, they found over a million, 1.4 million common MERS. The storm petros, the east coast of Canada, and Bakalu Island, has the biggest, uh, the biggest breeding colony on the entire planet. It's around 3 million breeding pairs. Now, I've been out there many years because uh, the, they're nocturnal. You have to go out there in the dark and trying to record them, catch them coming in or leaving. I've never seen one. No carcasses floating around the islands. And I, I find that interesting because you're talking about six million birds. 
So it's pretty unlikely they're not going to find some sign of them. And when I talk to the locals, uh, they admit, um, or the media has admitted that there's been a big decline, but it hasn't been a public thing. So then we had uh, beers showing, grizzly bears showing up emaciated, and they were trying to blame that on the salmon, but grizzly bears' biggest part of their diet is grubs, uh, uh, berries, they'll eat 200,000 berries a day, and they bioaccumulate. Berries, by the way, will bioaccumulate radiation. It's very bad. It's a very easy way to get leukemia if you're getting it in the wrong place. So five million sockeye salmon never returned, 600,000 came back, and because there was only six, what they call only 600,000, the beers uh, were bearing the brunt of, and no pun intended. But what actually happened is beers will just substitute with caribou or moose or elk, uh, and they'll eat other species, right? And particularly berries and grubs and grass and stuff like that is 90% of their diets. And so it's dishonest to suggest the bears were, the bears are emaciated because you eat so many berries. And the berries is your enemy, like mushrooms right now. Mysterious mass deaths of Alaska birds baffle scientists. Tens of thousands of dead birds washing up. Uh, the birds have all, now, we're not quite into the show. We're just doing a preamble to get you acclimated to this has been going on for since Fukushima. The birds, all of the species known as common murs, appear to have starved to death. To starve, never, well, it's not that they appear to, they had starved to death. We know they're starving, their stomachs are empty. They're, the biologist who examined the birds says they appear emaciated, their stomachs were empty. So when you think about, you'll hear about uh, pilot whales where they're, oh, that's normal, it's been going on for years, and they, they like running up on the beaches together. Well. There are incidences of it, but it's not a common thing. But there is incidences of it where the polar whales are known to group up and go up in a whale. But uh, 2017 and earlier in New Zealand and Australia, those polar whales were, were described as emaciated. After 2018, maybe, I guess, at the latest, they stopped referring to the health of the whales. So when you see 10 sperm whales, sperm whales don't have any legacy of beaching themselves in groups. And all of these, by the way, were emaciated that we're talking about. You can also add the krill, which is an incredibly important invertebrate without the backbone, they're big, like big shrimp. They can live up to 10 years. And they, they are migratory. And so all the migratory species, well, not all of them, but a lot of them will migrate with this kind of um, species. Uh, whales won't stop killing themselves in New Zealand. And we covered all of this as it was happening. So 51 polar whales had died at one, in one day. There was 140. 45 polar whales, nine pygmy killer whales, and two other unrelated strandings. There was 90 whales beached themselves late Thursday on Chatham Island in New Zealand. And so many, they've never seen nothing like it. And uh, media was trying to downplay it, saying that it's a normal... But the majority of the die-offs have happened like collectively in the last 12 years. You're talking about strategy across the entire breadth of New Zealand in a short period of time. And so they've never seen nothing like that. There has been incidences of mass strategies, but not across the entire breadth of the country at the same time. Because that's kind of the end of the road for the migratory uh, for these particular whales, right? More than 400 whales beached themselves in New Zealand. We covered this as it was happening, by the way. And <clears throat> we're almost to 
we still got a little bit to go. We're still into the preamble to get you acclimated to the big story. 200 whales stranded themselves, refloated themselves. New Zealand just experienced its largest whale stranding in decades. Well, no, this was, there wasn't, there was no, when they say in decades, you're claiming as if this happens all the time. Well, it doesn't. There's been one event before, and that was during the nuclear testing, nuclear bomb detonations. More than 600 pilot whales washed ashore in New Zealand's South Island over the past two days. We covered that. It was alive. Uh, this story came last year. Uh, the great shearwaters are the primary casualties. Starvation had caused mass birth deaths. Now, last year, there was a mortality event they were trying to associate with the bird flu. And this place is right in the middle of the die-offs. They'd done independent testing from what the other states and counties were doing. And they, they came out and said, the large number of dead birds found on the island shore in June have been confirmed to have died from starvation. Not from, in June, the state issued an announcement suspecting highly pathogenic avian influenza to be killing the birds, including seagulls, ducks, terns, cormorants, in the Massachusetts coastal areas. But they'd done independent testing. No highly pathogenic avian influenza was found, and all these species had died of emaciation. They had all starved to death. It wasn't just one species, even though it was a lot of shearwaters, but it was many other species. All were emaciated, and the consensus is they died of starvation. Since late 2022, scientists have detected the virus in more than 100 species of wild ducks. Uh, seagulls, geese, hawks, owls, uh, bears, foxes, bobcats, raccoons, dolphins. And so basically, they're trying to blame the bird flu for all mortality events, which is bizarre, really. Science doesn't really support that. And when you see all these descending stories, then you're left with the truth. Explosion of sea lion deaths in Peru among the deadly bird flu outbreak. And so when you look at it, the pictures of the sea lions are severe emaciation. Bird flu, emaciation like this takes a very long time. Bird flu happens right away in a couple of days. So this is not bird flu, obviously. This is severe emaciation. At least 3,487 sea lions were found dead. So this is an absurd number. You're talking about almost 3,500 dead sea lions, claiming it's due to the virus, but the pictures are clearly emaciated animals. This is not bird flu. This is emaciated animals. Climate likely paid a role in the 40% drop in the Pacific gray whale population. Climate change. Uh, this is an interesting thing to blame it on. Scientists are investigating what caused 40%, 40% decline, and they blame it on food scarcity. In other words, they were emaciated. So it went from 27,000 in 2016 to 16,650, over 10,000 dead gray whales, and we've covered them that whole time. You couldn't keep up with it. And birth rates are down 40% in the last year. Stunning. So here we go. We're up to date now. We're at where we started this uh, gathering was in May the 15th, was the last show. So this is the May the 16th, all the way up to June the 15th to today, that we're going to cover from here out. 
Dead whales so emaciated his ribs were sticking out. And vicious peanut head. Um, but that's his ribs. So, like, we've seen a lot of the emaciated whales over the years. We've covered a lot of pictures. I've never seen it this bad. This is extraordinary. Because usually they, they go from 12 inches of blubber to two or three, and they die from complications, right? So it's extraordinary to see him show up. That one showed up alive on the beach and died. But it's emaciation is second to none that we've saw. And so that's a terrible, that's a terrible warning. A 10-ton beached sperm whale was so thin when it died, his ribs were sticking from its side. Thirty-five point four feet, so it wasn't full grown. That was really something, though, wasn't it? Because they get. Well, that was a full-grown female. That's right. They usually get fourteen tons, so it was missing about eight thousand pounds. It's the second one to wash up in the UK beach in two days. Yeah, an adult female. It was There was little evidence it had eaten plastic. And this is another thing over the last, say, four or five years that we notice where they'll actually say stuff like this. It's unbelievable that they would even say anything like that. But there has been a lot of attempts to blame it on plastic in uh, 2019, 2020. And now they actually put out a disclaimer. They'll always check for plastic. But there's never been a whale pre-Fukushima that died of plastic. And since then, there's only one that has allegedly had a lot of plastic in it. But it, it, they said it didn't die of the plastic. So it's a really weak argument. But it's enough to confuse the typical population who don't know any better. There was little evidence that it had eaten plastic. Had poor nutritional condition. When you're so emaciated, your ribs are sticking up in the air and there's nothing left whatsoever. Calling it poor, you might as well call it emaciated. They don't like using the word emaciated. And a lot of stories that I've noticed, you notice if you've been around a while, is where they'll say the whales weren't emaciated or they were in good health. <laughs> there was nothing in the stomach, but they were in good health. And these are really bizarre connotations because we've been covering this for a long time. We've never heard or seen them do that before until recently. And it's most likely in the responses to us covering this uh, particular subject. It suffered a significant muscle wastage it was the thinnest sperm whale they've ever worked on, this one person. It was it's the thinnest whale anybody ever worked on. The whale was very far from home. It wasn't in its normal territory. And we see this a lot. And last year, in a, in a, like a one week or two week period, we gathered up four or five stories of whales that showed up emaciated far up freshwater rivers. One of them included Montreal, Canada, where whales have never been heard of before. But that was like in, in less than a two-week period, we found all these dead whales up in rivers. It was really surreal. And this is the only, the second sperm whale ever recorded in whales over the last century. Uh, this was a great story, moss. How many people think moss is a good thing? Because moss is actually an ecosystem. Most people consider it a plague, right? But moss is actually an incredible ecosystem. A new study identifies several surprising benefits of moss. I might as well put that on the bigger screen for everybody. Many benefits of moss, and hopefully inspire you to look at moss in a whole different way. The global contribution of soil masses to the ecosystem 
And look at all the people on that study. The big boost to the environment. Gobsmacked, I think. And there's an incredible ecosystem, and that a huge part of the planet is actually moss. There's, and these are huge ecosystems. There's 123 identified worldwide of the ecosystems of moss. And they cover 9.4 million square kilometers. And these are, th are thriving ecosystems. And they call it, a, everything is a heat sink for CO2, by the way, because you can't have life without CO2. And this one in particular, I think they're shown as goldfish and moss is a very vibrant ecosystem. There's incredible diversity. The lifeblood of plant ecosystems. <coughs> uh, Republicans demand New Jersey government Murphy halt offshore wind projects for 30 to 60 days amid spats of whale debts. So trying to conflate whale debts with windmills is pretty, imp pretty impressive nut stuff. Uh, they've been building windmills for at least 20 odd years, and we've never seen a mortality event because of them anywhere on the planet. But uh, we have seen whale die-offs, emaciated whales for the last decade in the same place because of Fukushima. And so there's the pro-nuclear community don't want windmills. And windmills, by the way, should be replaced with geothermal and then wind after as, as a, an enhancement to the geothermal. Because geothermal is available everywhere on Earth. So they want to investigate whether whales, wind projects are killing marine life. And this is a ludicrous, absolute, ins uh, I'm just totally shocked whenever I hear. And I got studies shown it doesn't destroy birds. Birds are not stupid, by the way, right? Let, like, have you ever seen a bird fly through trees at full speed? Save our whales. So there's a, there's this big, and they want to direct, they got to blame something. They can't blame the nuclear industry because they're trying for a nuclear renaissance. But to try to blame the whale, the die-offs of the whales on birds, and the whales are all emaciated. They're not dying, right? They're showing up emaciated. And windmills don't make whales emaciated. And it takes uh, eight, 10,000 kilometers of migration before the whales become emaciated. <clears throat> um, scientists respond to concerns over strandings of dolphins, porpoises, and whales. That's an emaciated um, sperm whale. On the Welsh coast, um, so United Kingdom, for instance, the, over, since 2016, there's been around 5,000 dead whales. There's over, but you can, they found at one point over a, a hundred in just one week, a hundred in different decomposition stages of beak whales, beak whales, they're deep divers. They mostly feed on squid. And so you're only gonna, f they figure you're only gonna find 10% if you're lucky, which means there was around a thousand beak whales must have died for them to find a hundred. It was most likely a lot higher than that. And like the gray whales, where you've seen this mortality event of 40%. 
And they're not trying to blame that on the windmills, by the way. A dead porpoise was also found on the beach, along with a common dolphin. So pre-Fukushima nuclear meltdowns, the, the reports of two dead mammals on the same beach, I think was unheard of. After Fukushima, it was constant. Multiple strandings around the UK. And you're looking at emaciated whales. It was really interesting they would use the one with his rib sticking out. But clearly these whales don't look like your typical beach whales. They're very emaciated. I don't know why there are currently so many, perhaps it's a coincidence. Well, it's been a coincidence since a couple of years after Fukushima and it has never stopped. Chances are the stranding are not directly related to each other. But no, chances are they are because it's so rare to have more than one whale show up at the one time pre-Fukushima. 68 porpoises washed up at the coastline in 2022. And so far this year, there's only been 20, but uh, you're far from the end of the year. And pre-Fukushima, there would be maybe one would wash up on the coastline. Hippo charges at a canoe. This was an interesting story. Now, I'm not saying this got anything to do with Fukushima, but when I do find stories like this, I'll include them because that's a ferocious animal. 24 people feared dead after capsizing the canoe. And remember, these are incredibly impoverished people. That's the boats they're talking about. That's the actual boat. And they got a real attitude, the hippo. Boat was supposed to only carry 10 people, but allegedly was carrying 24. And as it made its way across parts of Newfoundland. Now, this is Newfoundland. And anybody remembers the research expeditions we carried out, we noticed this new phenomenon. And fog, you're not supposed to be able to get close to fog. And I, I played videos of when I was camping of fog hitting my quad and trailer and going around it like it was like smoke would do. Fog doesn't actually do something like that. And it was blown about 35 kilometers an hour. And so as a young man growing up on the Atlantic Ocean, we go out on the ocean fishing, you would pray for a little breeze of wind when there was fog, because that would disperse the fog. And it was easier for you to find your watch boy out in the middle of the Atlantic, right? And now fog is actually coming into your house, coming into your vehicle, and acting like smoke uh, when it hits obstructions. And we've never seen that before. So I'm just gonna play that little clip of this one. Now I'm not saying that's what this is, uh, but I just wanted, I used it just so I can remember to tell you. These time-lapse images show an Arcus cloud with a uniquely shaped frayed border. This type of cloud often announces the arrival of a cold front, but may also form from the cool sea breezes. Either way, the dramatic look is caused by a mass of cold air descending and a mass of warm and humid air rising. Now, in my lifetime, I've never seen that personally. That's here where I'm to. Uh, oh, and in China, in China, these were uh, mosquitoes. I've never, they've never seen it before, and I've never seen this before coming up. I think it's mosquitoes. These are swarms of insects. Nobody's ever seen it before. As far as the eye can see. That's pretty crazy. I've never... And when I see large swarms of insects right now, the first question I'm going to have is, where are the predators? Because predators would love stuff like this, right? This is a... This is a incredible opportunity to and this is how the animal kingdom works right they'll take advantage of the uh, ireland follows a global trend for increased whale and dolphin beachings 
that that whale is looking emaciated to me, and, you, and I say that because you can see the peanut head. See where his hand is too? It's concaved, and see where it's snout is too, where the bone is actually showing? And then see the top of the whale, you can see the whole spine. That's not normal, right? That's not normal. So up where the nose, the snout is too, rather, it's completely concave. And the head itself is what they call a peanut head. So that's an emaciated whale, period. Increasingly, whales and mammals, dolphins, and are encountered when they wash up and become stranded, increasingly, because it's not normal. Last month, a common dolphin was found death, dead, a pilot whale, both in Wexford, excuse me, and a huge sperm whale washed ashore. Another sperm whale, this one alive, was beached. And the rate of beaches and strandings appear to be increasing, mirroring a worldwide trend, which we cover uh, once a month, basically, sometimes twice a month, depending. SDA takes a step towards vaccinating endangered California condors against the bird flu. So you got there's many different strains of the flus, right? So you got to make sure you got the right strain. How are you going to catch all the condors to... It's very confusing. Very confusing. And I'm not saying there's not a bird flu strain out there. It's out there... The, there's always these flus out there, but because the birds' immune systems are compromised, they're more susceptible to those pathogens and viruses that were normally harmless and innocuous and benign. CBS to cop off, this is here in Newfoundland where I'm currently too, CBS to cough up cash to clean up seal carcasses. So there's around 50 seals washed up in this one spot. So the white ones are, the confirmation, they're very, very young. I missed it. I didn't find the story until about six days later. I went there, and I didn't find them. They had cleaned it up, I would imagine. And they expected uh, $15,000 to clean up 50. So somebody was making a lot of money. Earlier in the month, 20 dead seals washed ashore just steps from a residential neighborhood, and on Wednesday that the numbers of carcasses had grown to about 50. Now, we had the major beachings, and I covered them here in Newfoundland. Uh, three times in a row, we had dolphins beach, we've, and that's the first time we've ever had a die off of dolphins. And the one in Carboneer we found, I think it was 28 washed up, um, a few days ago, I found a story showing the locals and fisheries and oceans trying to rescue a few of them, which is interesting because I couldn't, I never found that before. And so I even said it was very strange that we they didn't rescue them. And I just wanted to correct it because I had, we couldn't find any information saying that had happened. But a few days ago, I actually found a clip of them trying to rescue and bring them, I think, to Harbor Grace, put them in the ocean down there, of some of the dolphins. But dolphins are not supposed to be here. They're supposed to be up in Nova Scotia somewhere. They get here late spring when there's no ice. And throughout history, we've never recorded a die-off pre-Fukushima. But post-Fukushima, there has been a couple of beachings. But this year, there was three. They're not supposed to be here. They were they were driven here because of lack of food, I would imagine. So I went there and I couldn't find the dead carcasses. And some of them did have their eyes removed by seagulls. And over the last number of years, that's very unusual, and that should be the first thing that happens. I'm not going to show you those particular pictures, but that's just another part of the equation. 
it doesn't mean Fukushima, obviously, right? Um, but it's just, it happens to be a die-off, so I'm going to cover it. Uh, but they could have been abandoned because of lack of food, right, by their mothers, and that's why they end up dying. They show sewage running out, hard cases. These are all young ones. When you see them white, that's young seals. Yeah, I went, I went right there, and I didn't find the carcasses when I found out about the story. It was maybe, I'm not sure, really. I think it could have been 10 days later or something. But to see them all gathered up in one spot is interesting. I can't make any kind of um, comment because I didn't see it. So if I had to got there to see it, So this is the most easterly point of Canada we're talking about where I'm currently too. Right, so out on this Avalon, what they call the Avalon Peninsula, and this is not a very wide peninsula, so the winds will blow right across this fairly quick. And this is the biggest migratory, uh, Newfoundland is the biggest migratory seabird run on the entire planet with around 46 million migratory birds a year. And we've been researching this down here uh, in the Atlantic for three years. And what we discovered was we are not seeing the migratory birds. And when you ask people, when was the last time you seen a flock of migratory birds? They're like, well, actually, I can't remember. But yet officially, it's still the biggest migratory run. But as we know, because we've done research expeditions also across the province, checking for insects and checking the ponds, and we didn't find the migratory birds there all either, or loons. We did find some loons, but uh, we didn't see them, but we did hear them. And in the forest, uh, in 2019, you would hear the birds, but you wouldn't see them. In 2020, you would hear them, but not as much, but you still wouldn't see them. None would visit your campsite. In 2021, we didn't hear the birds in the forest anymore, uh, or last year, right, in 2022. Navy vet who claimed to have killed Bin Laden is the Wright's new anti-drag poster child. So the guy who claimed he killed Bin Laden, right, because you know all the controversies, that story shouldn't have been in my apologies. Uh, that got slipped in. But that was very strange, isn't it? The guy who claimed to kill Bin, L Bin Laden was a transvestite. We expect a lot more transvestites worldwide because of Fukushima. But obviously he was pre-Fukushima. Ministry of Ecology explains reasons of deaths of seals of the Caspian Sea. Is... The populations are a change in the migration route of seals and poaching. Carcasses of dead seals and dead fish. So finding dead seals and blaming it on the poachers is one thing, but to find dead seals and dead fish up in the Caspian Sea, we've covered a few stories like that over the last two years, is suspect, right? And they're saying the reason for decline in the population is a change in the migration routes of seals and poaching, which is the strangest statement imaginable. But hey, that's, that's Russia we're talking about. Giant pearl jellyfish wash up on Gwynedd Beach leaves walkers terrified. Of course, this is... The United Kingdom's media is just cuckoo land, isn't it? Have you ever tried to read the, the major medias from the United Kingdom? Like, really, you talk about degenerate media. It's almost all tabloid-type medias. It's very disappointing. It's meant to keep people in a constant state of... of stupid, I would imagine. And there's a large population that, like, that are used to that, see, and then they come to expect it. Ireland follows a global trend. We just covered that, didn't we? Yeah. A glo well, that's a different story, that's all. 
uh, it's the same story as a different media. A global trend for increased whales and dolphin beaching, seals and sea lions, porpoises, and dolphins. More than half of them in Scotland appear unrelated. Well, can, well, it's, you, got, you wouldn't like it's a global trend, so it's not unrelated. So you can't call it a global trend, and then in the next first sentence say it's unrelated. Do you get what I'm saying? How, how can you call it a global trend and then in the very first sentence says they're unrelated, but there's a global trend? It was a rare occurrence to have many in such a short space of time. Of the seven since April the seventh, four have been around Scotland. And there is nothing between these cases will link them together outside of, you know, global trend. And so I, I, I despise what literally my whole soul, the British Dive and Marine Life Rescue groups, I despise these people. I've covered them for so long, I actually despise these people. But clearly this whale is emaciated. Not almost emaciated, that's emaciated. That's a peanut head, you can see the spine is gonna be emaciated, or gonna be sticking out, the ribs are sticking out. A dead mink whale. No evidence of major trauma or entanglements. A fin whale. Well, fin whales are usually fairly skinny looking. So it's, next thing you gotta look for is how much fat does it have around its spine and its head, right? And it's hard to say when you're looking at the bottom of it like that. The fin whale took his last breath and passed away, and the animal was in poor body condition. Poor body condition. They usually can weigh up to 112, 114 tons. So poor body condition is, is only one we've been hearing for the last two years. Uh, before that, we were hearing thin and skinny, and... A couple of years for that, everything was described as emaciated. But they kind of got they they generally avoided the word emaciated over the last couple of years. So this is in poor condition. This is the animosity equivalent of emaciated. And fin whales are generally thin looking anyway. This is fifty five foot. So this is very emaciated because typically, because they can grow eighty five feet and they can weigh 114 tons. This is absurd numbers we're talking about, by the way. So the 3rd of May, a humpback whale, the 7th of May, a mink whale, the 7th of May, another mink whale in another place. Uh, very poor body conditions. Make notes the whales was in incredibly poor body condition, incredibly. Uh, the sperm whale was found to be female and only the fourth female sperm whale to beach in the UK in the last century. But clearly this one is emaciated. And they even acknowledge it, they just don't use the word. Humpback whale washes ashore uh, New Jersey, Long Island. It's the ninth so far in 2023. <clears throat> now there's been a lot of dead whales who are trying to blame all of the deaths, every one of them, on windmills. Let's get through these pictures anyway. Humpback whale washing up in Long Island is the ninth humpback whale this year. There's many other species washing up. When you look at his tail, you can tell it's emaciated. With the lower body and the tail, that should be quite thick and it's not. So that's emaciated. 
Republican demand New Jersey Governor Murphy halt offshore wind projects for 30 to 60 days amid a spate of emaciated whales. Well, it takes a couple of months for the whales to be that emaciated. Calls them to stop offshore wind projects as more whales wash up dead. Yeah, but the majority of the whales are clearly emaciated. So to, And so now they got save our whale banners on the boats down there and they're trying to blame the windmills instead of having a real conversation. A whale washing up on a beach used to be once a year, now it's once every couple of days. I like this one here. No whales have ever been killed from coal-fired power plants. <laughs> That's a badass comment right there, eh? <laughs> Sperm whales are washed up near uh, Aberscoach, so thin her ribs were protruding. I would imagine that's the same one we covered uh, earlier. I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming it was. Changing weather is affecting songbirds' migration. Changing weather. After she collected data from the Citizen Science app, I just hate academics when they do stuff like that. Video shows the alleged ivory bill woodpecker as U.S. moves towards extinction decision. Yeah, it's not supposed to exist, but there's a picture of it. Oh, this one is looks like it's a taxidermy, right? New video photographs proposing to show Ivory Bill Woodpecker flying in the Louisiana forest were published by researchers on Thursday. As the government officials say they will make a final decision this year on whether the birds are extinct. Always sad when you see stuff like that. Why are India's lions increasingly swamping the jungle for the beach? Yeah, that's a great question. Why are they going to the beaches all of a sudden instead of the forest? What was the catalyst, I wonder? Uh, usually, if there's food in the forest, they're not going to... They've always been in the forest. They've never been on the beaches. Oh, well, I'm sure they've been out there sometimes, but not regularly. So it was an Asiatic lion, the king of the jungle, increasingly the beach. Yeah, can you imagine being on a beach and seeing that slumbering towards you? Between 2010 and 28, the number of lions along the coast rose from 20 to 104. They blame the habitat loss. Or it could be the species die-offs. They don't have food. To see lions on the edge of the sea is an incredible sight, yes. I can't even imagine. Unlike Nambia's coast, uh, lions, they do not prey on marine animals. But now they've developed a taste for scavenging dead fish. Hey, when you got nothing left to eat, dead fish are fine, right? Lions have adapted to hunt seals and seabirds in Nambia, study finds. They adapted. Well, the only reason you're going to go that direction is if they can't find their natural prey, right? Got themselves a seal. Scary shit, man. Among the creatures they've been recorded eating are fur seals, flamingos, and comorants. We actually are getting comorants here on the coast, the east coast of Canada, and they're not indigenous to this coastline. I've never seen them growing up. And when I talk to the old timers around here a lot, I always remember to ask them, what do they think of the comorants? And they're, they're all aware of it now. They said, well, they've never existed before on the east coast. Now, I've been doing research expeditions. Uh, we got bad weather for the last it must be eight or nine days now. And now we got tides are late in the day. So hopefully next week the winds are supposed to change. Summer might e actually happen. 
and we can get back on the ocean and do some research. We punched in five days, and the birds we found in prime spring was dismal. It was unbelievably dismal. Among the creatures they've recorded eating are fur seals, flamingos, and cormorants. A lion needs a lot of meat, and, and flamingos and cormorants, which are birds, it might be a snack randomly in their lifetime, but not their diet, right? A lion carrying a cormorant. That's the strangest picture imaginable. So, like, he's probably got to eat 20 of them to get a meal. Let's put it that way. 2017, a lioness in poor condition was spotted hunting cormorants, while others were seen hunting flamingos and teals, ducks. Stander said he had observed lions foraging in the intertidal zones. So the possible their diet could expand to shellfish, but let's hope they don't eat shellfish because they're filter feeders. They bioaccumulate radiation 125,000 times more than a fish would. And crabs and sea turtles. Well, the only reason they're doing that is because their diet is missing. So we'll be keeping an eye on that stuff in the future. Because that's the first time we've covered that type of story, right? Of lions being forced to go somewhere else to find food. And the food that they're hunting, they're going to have to hunt one every 10 minutes to get a meal each day. Lakes are shrinking at an alarming rate to due to climate change. <clears throat> and climate change is radioactive fallout, by the way. Let me explain that to you, because that might seem confusing to people who are used to being bombarded with propaganda from the scumbag media. I got a perfect way of uh, articulating that particular point. This model is based on 30 days, I believe of radioactive fallout from Japan. And so I'll tell you when you're at 20 days, and then I'll explain it. You're at 20 days right now. So this is an invisible plume that never goes away, covers the entire planet, the entire. So think of a snowstorm covering the entire planet and the snow never melts. And flip that to radiation, but you can't see it or smell it or hear it or feel it or taste it or touch it or pick it up or throw rocks at it, but it's real. It's pulsing energy up to 40, 50 feet away from each one of them if they're by themselves, right? But if there's other, if there's gammas and alphas and neutrons and betas, when they hit each other, almost at the speed of light, they change direction. By the way, this is pure energy we're talking about. Every second, each atom pulse energy almost at the speed of light. Think about how much energy it takes to make something go to speed of light, first off. And you can really appreciate why we're talking about radiation. So an invisible snowstorm that never goes away and is still ongoing has been going on for 80 years. So this was, this was the tipping point. This was the, the pulse, a major pulse in 2011. This has been going on for 80 years. Now, gas, oil, and coal emissions, which is carbon, don't pulse energy every second for millions of years. Nuclear does. Gas, oil, and coal emission only travels 50 to 100 miles, by the way. This is the only, you won't find models, uh, planet-wide plume models over 30 days of emissions from coal, gas, or oil, because it doesn't do that, and that's why you won't see it. But the only one you're going to find models like that is radioactive fallout. And it's stunning to see this particular model. There's many like it. This is the French government. And so this is, this is global warming. And it kills the bacteria, it kills the fungus in the forest, for instance, in the grasslands. And so they don't soak up water anymore. They don't break down the foliage and the litter anymore. And, and it doesn't soak up water. So now the water runs off it to the lakes and estuaries and streams and then down to the oceans. And it carries a lot of the nutrient-rich soil with it because it's not penetrating into the earth because it doesn't have the biota anymore to maintain it.
Uh, so they're, they're talking about... Let me see here. An analyst of approximately 2,000 world's largest lakes revealed it losing roughly 5.7 million trillion gallons a year now. It's due to primary two primary factors, warm air leading to increased evaporation and the water doesn't get soaked up by the earth because the biota is not there anymore to break down the foliage and the litter, right? Because you kill the bacteria and the fungus like they did at Chernobyl. But this was such a global pulse. So they say a third more natural reason for shrinking water resources is the change in precipitation and river runoffs. This could also be the result of climate change. And they're using climate change for every excuse for the last, since Fukushima in particular. And uh, since 2015 at the Paris Accord, this has been an agenda. But it was clearly obvious in 2015 that Fukushima was a death pulse for Earth. A species extinction crisis at our doorstop, doorstep, protecting the Piper Plover. I gotta go to the smaller screen with this one. Uh, of the Rockaway Peninsula. Species extinction crisis at our doorstep. On the Rockaway Peninsula nest are cities, one federally protected species under the Endangered Species Act in 1973, the piping plover. About 100 come to our sandy beaches each year, traveling from the Bahamas where they winter, and the tiny chicks are flightless and must feed themselves from birth, requiring unfettered access to the shoreline to feed and survive. It's just a beautiful bird, isn't it? Isn't that something? In 2022, 57 American oyster catcher eggs were taken, a federally protected species under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, as were four plover eggs, an adult piping plover was found dead. By setting aside beach habitat undisturbed, we can help to save the species. We'll get to it. So May the 19th is not only Endangered Species Day, it's the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. Despite some 90% of Americans supporting endangered species protection, recent votes in Congress are seeking to strip protection for multiple species, including northern long-eared bats, lesser prairie chickens, and rescind the Biden administration broader definition of critical habitat. The only last ditched hope in the presidential veto more than one million species on the brink of an extinction. We lost more than three billion birds since 1970, which was the cancer epidemic started. This was the peak nuclear weapons testing. Well, it started in the late 40s, but by 1970, the planet was buried in continuous radioactive fallout. And so we can trace a lot of this back to then, but Fukushima was an pulse event and it wiped out the tidal zones in particular because the radioactive fallout runs down the mountains and a lot of it ends up on your coastlines if it don't get caught up somewhere else, right? We should protect the endangered species because we can. And we have the ability to write the course. And for the same reason we care about polar bears and whales, we should care about the piping plovers. Well said. Weather report, heat wave, hot winds continue to wreak havoc in Delhi. And water pot campaign for animals and birds. A water pot campaign. So they put out 500 water pots because the temperature is around 40 degree, 43 degrees Celsius, which is 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So what they done was a water pot campaign to quench the thirst of animals and birds, and each day they filled the pots back up with water a couple of times, which is a wonderful thing, right? I love stuff like this. 
So you have water pots in 500 places, keeping the earthen and stone utensils of water for these animals, birds and animals in more than 500, there's more than 500 places where they have uh, water pots. And so the birds and the animals know to come back to this spot each day because they're gonna fill it up. This is a great, it's a great story. And that the work of filling the waters in these water vessels every morning and evening is also being done by the organization. And a special volunteer team is working for this work, which is filling water and grains in the water vessels in the morning and evenings. Just really, that's such a great story. Such a, that's an amazing story. Bless her hearts for doing that. Video shows dead sperm whales washed up dead on Spanish beaches. And last year, yeah, last year we were covering 14, at the end of the year, it was 14 sperm whales washed up in Australia. And there was two large strandings of whales. Let me go back here. Yeah, sperm whales, when you see their tail, they're very thin. Look at that. That's some series, and their heads are too. So more than likely, that's emaciated. When you look at the tail, it's really telling. The spine sticks out. It's very emaciated. And it was hard to get a clean shot, so... To me, that's clearly emaciated sperm whale. Sperm whale measuring eight to 10 meters long, 12, 10 to 12 tons. Dead mink whale calf found washed up under rocks. And this is clearly skinny, but uh, it's quite a, a bit of decomposition going on. And there's nothing on the beach, is there just a bit of kelp cabbage? but there's no other visible species on the beaches down there. Just a week after carcass of a large seal washed up in a nearby beach. Warning, not to kill slugs or snails in your gardens or use slug pellets. Forty-eight percent of bird species declined in the UK over a five-year period. 48% over five years. That's catastrophic numbers we're talking about. They're crucial to keeping the birds, because birds will eat them, right? The data released by the government this year, 2023, showed a mammoth 48% of the bird species have declined in numbers in just five years between 2015 and 2020 on top of that, a huge and sudden drop where, and they seen over 5,000 beachings of whales and dolphins and porpoises and seals and sea lions, which means around 50,000 have died, right? You only find 10% if you're lucky. The main cause of this habitat loss and loss of mixed farming, I got no idea what they're talking about. Get a honeydew melon, cut it in half, eat the melon while preserving skin in two hemisphere shapes. Then go and put the melon skins in your garden near the crops facing downward like a dome. Then go and lift the melon up the next morning. You'll see nearly every slug in your garden is in that melon because I would rather have melon than your crops. Then you can take the melon a few miles away and release the slugs. And boy, boy, slugs. That's a great idea. Rather than killing them, right? And we have to think that way because we're being exterminated too, right? And so we have to try to help the species whenever possible because there's not that many of us aware. So those that are and do try to help are going to make a difference because not many people are even attempting to understand the significance. 
Swift, deadly epidemic kills all the black sea urchins in the Gulf of Elate, posing a threat to the coral reefs. A deadly epidemic kills all the black urchins. And generally what happens, because I used to pick 20,000 urchins a day, right? What happens is they'll lose all of their spines with any kind of sign of issues. And you'll see the white. When you see the white, that means there, there's no hope in saving them. Winging it, young birds may have set distant record uh, by flying nonstop from Alaska to Tanzania, which is New Zealand, right? Members of the Sandpiper family set a new nonstop distant flight record of migratory birds from Alaska to New Zealand. Wow. And we, I never see these on the beaches anymore when we were to the Pacific. 8,435 miles nonstop. At five months old, it left Alaska. 11 days later, touched down in Tanzania's northeastern tip. Uh, 13,500 kilometers at five months old, steady flying. That's insane. Godwits feed on insects, crustaceans, and mollusks. I said, they're in real trouble if you feed on insects, right? But they're... And worms. And there's around 480 species of worms along the Pacific coastline. So this one from Oklahoma... I think it's moths, is it? This was pretty amazing. And this is nighttime. Yeah, this is moths, which are pollinators, by the way. I'm going to play the little video. This is impressive. That's outside. Can you imagine seeing this at your home? Tatum Radcliffe of Oklahoma woke up on May 16th with a moth on her face and soon realized it was far from alone. While it's hard to identify the species in this video, May is the time Miller moths start their mass migration. Born on the plains, millions of Miller moths head for the mountains every spring searching for native flowers. They're important pollinators, but if you want to avoid this scene at your home, it's best to turn off your porch lights. A videographer. And we already showed you that one. A massive rare sea turtle washed up on PEI coastline. And PEI is way up to St. Lawrence. Way up there. I didn't think uh, sea turtles would go all the way up there for some reason. Not that I'm an expert in sea turtles or anything, but it was, that was quite, that was quite the statement because they eat jellyfish and PEI, there's a lot of fresh water coming down. The tides do reach there, so they, I'm sure they can do it. Blue whale, obviously they can if you found one, a uh, blue whale washes up dead on a beach in Pakistan. And it's hard to say because he's decomposed pretty bad. They can grow 100 feet long and weigh 200 tons, equal to approximately 33 elephants, 400, almost half a million pounds. <laughs> That's crazy. That's insane, right? An animal that weighs almost half a million pounds. But when you look at a healthy one, and you're looking at this one, the, the body shape is really 
out of proportions compared to what they should look like. So I'm assuming that's emaciated. And they primarily feed on krill, and krill are very vulnerable to radioactive fallout. And radioactive fallout, of course, the amount of radioactive fallout covering the planet is just nothing short of stunning. You have many, many different actual studies of the radioactive fallout, many models made of the projection of it. And they they were all they they were based on venting, not based on the inventories from the actual nuclear meltdowns. Dead whale washes up on Waymate Beach. Waymate Beach. And clearly this whale is very skinny. This is a Sotheby beak whale. This is a very deep diving whale that shouldn't be there. That's way out of its territory. It's unusual for Sotheby's beak whales become stranded as they tend to stay in deep water. A necropsy on the creature showed it may have died from a parasite, but it could take a few months for the results. We use the parasites because they're so emaciated. They're very vulnerable. 500 sick or dead, 5,000, I thought it was. Yeah, 5,500 sick or dead birds recorded in New Brunswick last year, scientists say, which is on the east coast of Canada. And, we're, and they're talking about a lot of it, which is the comorons. Cor we study them here on the east coast when we can, right? And because we covered, we covered all of those die-offs last year, they were happening. We've done presentations like this, and I can't remember off the top of my head. Now, in April of last year, there was a huge die-off on the coastline of MERS, and they were trying to blame it on the ice pack. They said the ice pack was 200 miles wide, so the birds couldn't find any food. The birds are actually really adept at uh, diving in ice packs, and because I grew up in a community with no cars, I'm very familiar with this. And the comorants in particular, they, they go high in the air and then they, they dive straight down at high speed. Uh, but there's many other species, right? There, there, uh, in April last year was the common murs, the turs, the thick-billed turs, which are basically murs, and the dovekites. So the first three eat anchovies and squid and sardines and capelin, you know, small, small fish. But the dove kites eat microscopic animals. So you had both species for around 600 kilometers of the coastline washed up every day by the hundreds in each community. And the government agencies, natural resource agencies and that were showing up and picking them up and not saying nothing and leaving again. But each day they would fill up the beaches again and the rivers and the freshwater lakes. And they were clearly emaciated. And the government even, the media even reported on it that they were emaciated. And the people they were doing interviews with, I called them up and done interviews myself with. And they told me they were emaciated, period. Not maybe, not almost, but they were definitely emaciated. Uh, and we estimated it was around a million of them would have died because it was such a big part of the coastline. We went physically down there and were stalked by two Japanese guys, which was a bizarre story on its own. Uh, researchers said there was 40,000 reports in eastern Canada from April to October. See, now in April, the birds were all considered emaciated. So it's very, 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 very dubious they would use April in this narrative. And around 5,500 in New Brunswick. So Canada, they said, was around 40,000. But like I went to every community. I talked to every gas station and every shop to get a handle on how bad it was in each area. And we're talking probably a half a million to a million birds would have died because most of the coastline is inaccessible. So if you're finding it in every single community, in the freshwaters and the rivers, then it's going to be symmetrical in the places you can't reach. 
And so they're trying to blame it on the flu, the pathogenic avian influenza, the likely cause. And I'm not saying the cause, the likely cause. But the reality of it was, in April, I camped out the first night in a snowstorm or ice storm, the second night in an ice storm, and the third night, because we I played the videos and the pictures for everybody on those expeditions when I came back, and the third night in a windstorm in minus 10 degree Fahrenheit temperatures with an all season uh, setup. And one year after the sick or dead wild birds started washing up a New Brunswick shore, it wasn't just a shore fishermen reporting at 25 miles offshore. And this, they were also, because uh, there was no colonies or camera or there was no colonies of I can't even remember their names now. My brain has just went. Uh, the the deep divers. What he? Why can't I remember that name? We just talked about it. But anyway, they found thousands of these up in Montreal. They don't belong in Montreal. There's no colonies up there. The only reason they would go all the way up there is if they were looking for food. And we know this is just a fraction of true mortality because not every bird is observed will be recorded. The Gannets is what I was trying to remember. And, and you know, I got videos here from the colonies, uh, not just from Bacaloo Island, but from uh, St. Mary's too, right? Where we found around, I think it was 30,000 Gannets out there nesting. But there was no other species nesting around them, which was really unusual. And that was two years ago, the common eider ducks, common murres, and large gulls. Now, the common murres, the, the thick back, the thick bill murres, the turrs, and the dove kites, that's different spectrums of the food chain because the dove kites are eating the microscopic animals, right? The zooplankton, the phytoplankton, whereas the, the murres and the common turrs and the thick bill turrs are eating large, you know, eight, nine, ten inch uh, anchovies and squid and sardines and capelin and stuff like that. And the common murr, of course, dives 600 feet all day long. And so they were showing up. There had to be at least a half a million or more died. Because uh, the, the mortality event all the way from Bonavista to uh, far down the lab. Uh, Dead Bay, Dead Man's Bay or something in Labrador. I can't remember the actual name. I think it was Dead Man's Bay or something. It's a very far down the Labrador coastline, which is a long, very long distance. We're talking about 10% of the Delta population of northern gannets. Common murs. One year after mass mortality event, they said a resurgence is expected to spring. So they're, they're claiming they're expecting another wave. But what we discovered was, and was reported in the media, was the birds were emaciated in April and um, May. Right? And we had Japanese stalkers stalking me when I was doing it. Hundreds of dead birds wash up in a Chilean beach. Chilean beach. Hundreds of dead birds. And they're treating it as the avian flu, obviously, but when you're dressed and doing this. But if, they, if there was that many of them, because you've seen them everywhere, the rest of them would have caught it too. Because they're all living right in that zone. Look at this. This is absurdness, see? Eh? So how come the rest didn't drop dead? Well, it's most likely they died from starvation. And we can quantify that assertion coming up in a little bit. It is unclear what caused the death of approximately 200 birds who washed up in northern Chile's province. Remember, Chile had over 300 whales show up dead a number of years back. Um, it was like six years ago, seven years ago or something. And because they were in later stages of de 
decomposition, it was hard to work out whether they were emaciated. I should dig up the story maybe, but we got a lot to get through yet. Local authorities have sent samples of birds to laboratories in San Diego to determine when they died of the massive bird flu and warned locals not to collect the birds to avoid infection of the bird flu. Again, right there, pre-2020, everything when you found it, like in these circumstances, were emaciated. They had died of starvation. Uh, and 2021 included. It wasn't until last year that they pulled the switch. At the same time, and we covered these stories, at the same time, all the baby raccoons and baby foxes and baby uh, animals in interior, kind of way far away from the ocean, were being tested for bird flu. And babies don't eat birds, right? And they were, you know, they were dependent on their mothers. And why would you check them? And so they stopped reporting on those types of reports uh, the following month. We covered all these bizarre headlines that were showing up in a two-week period. It was actually, you can actually see an agenda was going, was happening. Everything that was dying, no matter where it was to, was being tested for bird flu. And it was, uh, it's absurd. Response to avian bird flu in Senegal, Gambia, and Guyana. Appears to adapt to wild birds as a result. Water birds, seabirds have been particularly badly hit, in addition to birds of prey and scavengers. But pre this, everything that died, and we've seen the same types of headlines, was blamed on starvation. And then they flipped it. So 600 Royal and Caspian turs, these are seabirds, because uh, they're dependent on fish that are very vulnerable to radioactive fallout. It's pretty easy to uh, suggest that they had starved to death. You know, the next thing gonna be blaming the bird flu for the die off of starfish and, and sea stars and jellyfish. And, uh, following a patrol by the agents, uh, it was found 750 white pelicans died, including 740 young. So, so there was a really interesting way they they, they uh, narrated this, where they said 750 white pelicans died. But 740 were young, 10 were adults. So typically when you see that, that's starvation. That has all the earmarks of a starvation event. And they were abandoned, right? And so 10 adults were too weak to take off. That, that's, that is typically what we would expect to see from a starvation event where you got 750 pelicans, and the next sentence, 740 were young, were babies. In uh, neighboring Guyana, the figures are more alarming. 1,071 royal terns, 44 Caspian tur terns, one common tern, one gray-headed gull, two slender-billed gulls, one great cormorant, and one hooded vulture. This, like, bird flu is, uh, is just, as far as I can tell, bird flu is the cover story. According to April 15 National Situation Report, since the confirmation of the bird flu outbreak, 7,000 birds have died in the country, confirmed, which would be considered 10% of what actually died. And so they don't have any, they find the birds and immediately say, now these don't look like, these look emaciated. These don't look like they died. Because bird flu is allegedly kills you really quick, right? Testing birds that are found dead is essential not only to understand the effects of the population reproduction, but to rule out causes 
of mass mortality such as botulism, there are natural die-off events, and we cover that over the years, right? But I'm very pleased with what Fukushima has got done to the planet. You have to treat everything with suspect immediately. And then trying to suggest storms at sea, right? I mean, really? You're going to suggest storms killed seabirds that are genetically superior, built to and adapted for that environment? And I've been out at sea in storms, and birds are completely at home. It's completely dishonest right, to conflate storms at sea with the bird die-offs. U.S. will vaccinate birds against avian flu for the first time. <laughs> this cracks me up. So who knows what they're really up to? That's such a strange statement, isn't it? Bird flu outbreaks in minks sparks concern about spread in people. Outbreak of uh, influenza in a mink farm in Spain provides strongest evidence that the strain of bird flu, HSN1, can spread from infected mammals to another. Why unprecedented bird flu outbreaks sweeping the world are concerning scientists? Now, remember, I covered a story for you earlier where right in the middle where all the alleged uh, avian influenza bird flu was happening, independent, this is in the United States, sent them to their own laboratories and the birds were all described as emaciated and that there was no traces of influenza whatsoever. Most of the influenza stories are coming from the one laboratory which is pretty easy to spike the results when you do something like that is what I'm suggesting. And claiming it's going to spill over to people. And we see them categorically deny stuff like that many times. Bird flu fell nearly 9,000 marine creatures in Chile. 9,000. Let's go back to those, uh, before we do that, Let's go back to that. Let me remind you of that story before we jump on that. Hang on, I will get there. Is that it there? Yeah, starvation. No oh, sea lions. Yeah, that was chilly, was it? I can't remember. This is Peru, right by Chile. So think about this one where they had 3,500 uh, sea lions. Yeah, sea lions died. They blamed it on the bird flu, but when you look at the pictures that they provide to you, these are emaciated animals. It takes a very long time for them to lose all that fat. Right, to suggest that 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 is bird flu is absurd. As 3,500 sea lions were found dead, and the pictures, the two pictures, and they call it due to the virus, but when you see the pictures, these are severe emaciations. This is severe emaciated birds we're talking about. Okay, bird flu fell next door, 9,000 marine mammal, marine creatures in Chile. And so these are not great pictures to be able to zoom in on. Uh, nearly 9,000 sea lions, penguins, otters, small, cre uh, cre small dolphins and porpoises and stuff like that, uh, otters and whatever, sea, sea, mammals, right, have died in avian flu outbreak battering Chile's north coast, I think that's supposed to say. Since the beginning of 2023, more than 7,600 sea lions, 1,200 Humboldt penguins, 
which is Peru and Chile, and several otters, porpoise, dolphins are found dead along the coastline, which means it's around 90,000. In Cambodia, an 11-year-old girl had fever, colds, and sore throat and died from the bird flu, according to the ministry. Bird flu. You're talking about an area where healthcare is almost non-existent. But the Cambodian health authorities ruled out human-to-human -human transmissions, and it's rare for bird flu to jump to mammals, and rarer still that humans catch the potentially deadly virus. There is no treatment for the disease. Uh, from what we've seen over the last number of years, and what we've seen at uh, Peru, I just showed you that story of all the emaciated sea lions. That's not bird flu, that's emaciation. Bird flu doesn't cause emaciation. Opinion, I'm missing my bird and animal friends who usually visit in the spring. So this is somebody who enjoys all the creatures in the spring. Uh, quite a few of the unusual spring visitors not showing up, especially the birds and the bees. The swallows and songbirds are also absent. No more flying uh, insects, or have to deal with more flying insects, he says. Hummingbirds are missing. There's no bees showing up at their plants. I miss the sound of the happily humming trees clouded in bees harvesting nectar to make honey. I miss the aerial skills of the kingbirds and swallows consuming their weight and more in flying insects. And I hope to not miss the usual August migration of Rufus hummingbirds, but it seems there will be no area jousting at the feeders this year. The owls are missing, the kingbirds are missing, the hummingbirds are missing, the rabbits are missing, and the bees are missing. It's quite a statement because they're, this is their, obviously their, their spring joy and everything is missing and they're trying to quantify it. I look forward to next, uh, next spring and the return of my missing friends. If they're not there this year, they're not coming next year. Quite a statement, isn't it? Here's how to track bees, butterflies with a pollinator garden. By refraining from mowing, the, usual, the resulting weeds provide a food source and habitat for bees and other beneficial insects at a time of the year when few other food sources for these insects. And that's particularly like dandelions are such an important early flower. And uh, Monsanto insect uh, or pest repellents for gardens has pictures of dandelions. Dandelion is one of the most magical plants imaginable. It has all the micro macro nutrients that your body needs. And I used to regularly make um, dandelion tea, which was shown to really cut down on cancer. Uh, in fact, reverse cancer in a lot of people was dandelion tea root. So you take the root. And you 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 uh, scrape the root clean, and then you chop it up. And you boil it. You wash it first, and you chop it up and boil it in water, and just make tea out of it. And when you take a cup out, add another cup of water to it. So start off with say five cups or ten cups of water, and you can add similar amount of water to it before you gotta add more root. Which I should start doing again right now, actually. Return of the Rossetti spoonbill birds offer hope for Rio de Janeiro lagoons. I love hearing stories like that. Mass stranding of dolphins and the coastline uh, uh, and and he para coastlines. Mass stranding of dolphins. Twenty five rough tooted dolphins were stranded on a reef. And we had three strandings here this winter. Three, I cut all three of them. It was really something. 
It was heartbreaking to watch. They shouldn't be here at that time of the year, right? And they got scrapped by ice uh, in a couple of incidences where um, 15 surviving dolphins through water channels and out to sea. And we've seen the first stranding, we've seen Coast Guard icebreakers show up, a cutter, and broke the ice and, and let some of the dolphins out to open sea. It was kind of too late, unfortunately, but some did escape back out to sea. And, but they shouldn't have been here, right? They, they typically don't get here till late spring when the ice is long gone. A stranding of this size for this species is unprecedented, 25. And we had 29 in one stranding here. And uh, the official story was they were crushed by ice. I went there, documented it. We took a 1,000 pictures or something. I went there multiple days after. And they weren't squat up by ice. But they, I did see a video a few days ago of people trying to rescue them that I didn't find before. Because I thought it was really interesting where they were so accessible to the road that nobody tried to rescue them. And apparently they did. They just didn't succeed. Far North locals dashed to save five stranded whales in 90 Mile Beach. I'm not sure where the hell that is to. The juvenile whale was the first of five marooned on the shore of the West Coast Beach on Tuesday afternoon. Four of which were poly whales and another one was a sperm whale. So you had four poly whales and a sperm whale beaching in the same place. What the frig is the odd, uh, odds of that one, right? And that picture, you can see their spine outlined. It, sh it shouldn't look like that. That's emaciation causes that. And you can see the head is concaved right here. See the concave? That's what they call a peanut head. That's starvation. Possible storm could affect your sonar. Hey, maybe it was an alien come down and gave him an anal. Like, it's a garbage can diagnosis to suggest that animals that live in the open ocean can't deal with a storm. Do you got any idea how stupid you got to be to say something like that? And it's so common in the last couple of years, it's surprising. And these people know better. Department of Conservation Marine Technical Advisor said there's some evidence stormy weather can cause whales to strand. I have absolutely, unequivocally, never heard that before. I've heard them claiming that could be the storm. I never heard there was evidence. What kind of possible evidence could there be? And it's usually only the United Kingdom and Australia and New Zealand will say something like that with the British influence. It's completely dishonest to suggest that, by the way. In Patagonia, there's a nest that condors have used for 2,200 years. That's crazy, isn't it? 2,200 year old nest, wow. Another dead whale off the coast of New York, New Jersey. When you look at the back part of it and you see how skinny it is, that's clearly emaciation. What's well, interesting, that picture, I'm oh, sorry, I skipped. Is that another, or is that a shark feeding right there on the bottom right hand side? It's the last latest casualty in an unusually long list of whales that died in New York, New Jersey. And that whole coastline is not just New York and New Jersey. I told it to see, blah, blah, blah. 23 dead whales near you from December to February, 12 of them in waters off New York and New Jersey. Several have emerged since then. 
Officials didn't immediately provide an exact count. Dozens of dead sharks on a beach. These are dogfish, I believe, which are sharks, right? But it's very, very unusual. It's extraordinary, really. 25 to 30 sharks on a beach. It's extraordinary. And they said to find one or two is normal, but it's actually not. And so many is worrying. No, finding one or two is worrying. Finding 25 to 30 is catastrophic. And trying to collect data after reports of other washed up sharks in smaller numbers along a stretch of the coast. So all along the coastline, what they're alluding to is sharks are washing up dead. That's quite the statement. Dozens of dead sharks wash up separately on a British beach, leaving experts baffled. And pre-Fukushima, this kind of stuff is unheard of. Three sharks found dead on Cape Cod Beach. They stumbled across three small sharks dead in the sand the other side of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. Baby whale withers away under avian attacks. So they're saying baby whales are susceptible to bird flus. All the whales are showing up emaciated, now they want to blame it on bird flu. Hard <laughs> cases. Yeah, these are hard shows to do, no matter who you are. Has the Fukushima global radioactive fallout permanently compromised the ability of species to exist? And We've been stuck on 35 for about a half an hour. I've been censored so much that it doesn't bother me anymore, but it's pretty desperate to censor a conversation. After gold switched her focus from southern right whale mothers. So what the hell are we talking about here? So they're claiming seagulls are attacking baby whales. They've never heard of nothing like this. So after seagulls switched their focus, their attacks from southern right whale mothers to the calves, scientists recorded a drop in calf survival. That's such a dishonest thing to suggest, right? Improbable hunters are preying on whale calves off the coast of Argentina. And anything from Argentina, man. We've got stories out of there. There's some kooky shit over there, boy. This was a couple of days ago, June the 12th. Today is the 15th. Three pilot whales rescued after washing ashore in Cape Breton. Out of uh, 10 or 11, the local community turned out. And so they claimed that, uh, get a load of this now. So you, you can see, you see the guy over there, he's, he stood up almost to his hips in water. So there's tons of water right there. There's tons of water. 11 whales washed up in Nova Scotia, an official with the Marine Animal Response Society. I hate these people, by the way. Said an official with the Marine Animal Response, I hate every one of these organizations with a passion. Obviously, they're not set up for legitimate reasons. The locals pushed three of the whales back into the water. Eight of the whales died. There's another pot offshore. And so why didn't they all strand at the same time, I wonder? Because that's what they normally try to blame, right? Or hopefully they may leave the area, we're not sure. There's tons of water. So it's astounding when you hear them talking about the whales followed the food source in the shore and got trapped when the tide goes out. Well, they're not trapped, there's tons of water. There's literally tons of water right there. That's, that's a deliberate beaching, that's not trapped. So why would they suggest that it was an accidental stranding when they got tons of water? 
That's why I hate these groups because they do that a lot, right? The mass stranding event like this usually happens because whales follow a food source in the shore and gets trapped when the tide goes out. Except there's shitload of water and there's no reason to suggest that they're trapped. But clearly there's lots of water. And the media that's reporting this is the biggest in Canada, is the government media on top of that. Some of the people tried to save the whales said they returned to the shore after being freed, you know, because it's not shallow. So you got a bunch of teenagers found it, and you put them on a pedestal and downplay and claim that it was shallow water and they were chasing food. But when you see their spines, I'm not sure, did we look at that? Pre-2018, all of these pilot whale strandings were, were related to starvation. Bird flu kills thousands of penguins and sea lions. In the Republic of Chile, now we just covered that, right? It was uh, 50 species. Sea lions, pelicans, seagulls, penguins, Humboldt uh, died of bird flu, reported Chile's national. They don't have a very credible uh, government there at all. The 1,300 recorded cases of the Humboldt Penguins is probably less than the actual numbers because you only find a fraction. Among mammals infected were red foxes and skunks and fur seals in South America. Do not touch stranded marine mammals on Kangaroo Island. Uh, uh, South Australia has been warned not to touch the stranded mammals, including whales, dolphins, seals, sea lions. Instead, to call the parks and wildlife for advice. Because you're not allowed to be a human, you've got to turn to your, your gods before you're allowed to do anything. Kangaroo Island has a sheer dolphin sea stranding since 2011. Unfortunately, sometimes dead marine mammals washes up on beaches. Puffins. Oh, I was researching puffins for some reason and I stayed in the pile. Because we got puffins down here. We found, the last time I was out, I found 30. You should find 3,000. But uh, they flap their wings 400 times a minute because they're, they're made for diving all day. They're very shallow divers. They only stay down on the bottom itself. Once they get there, around 200 feet for about a minute. 30 seconds to a minute when they get there and they come back up. But they've been known, the Atlantic puffin we got here has been known to use sticks to scratch themselves with, which is considered a high level of intelligence when you see a bird using a tool. And instead of eating it and regurgitating it, they can carry eight or 10 small fish at a time back to their nest, which is a very successful routine, right? So you don't have to make as many trips. And they can dive as far as 60 meters, 180 feet, or nearly 200 feet, and stay there for roughly 30 seconds to a minute is what they're claiming. Some prey, I think they can stay a lot longer from my uh, findings, but some prey species like cape and sand needle, herring, and squid. And they feed almost exclusively on fish. But feed the chicks on a diet of fish. They, and the adults will eat zooplankton too, which is super interesting, actually. Because that's one of the first things to get wiped out by the radioactive fallout. Nova Scotia Wildlife Rehabilitation Center released five eagles in Cape Breton. Five eagles that needed to be rescued. They were young, some of them were young. They got pushed from their nest, they figured, and ended up emaciated, I think. Four juveniles, one's adult. Um, 
within the same week were found on the ground emaciated, so they weren't fed. So they couldn't find enough feed to take care of all the, the fledglings, so they, they picked and choose and then got rid of the smaller ones, right? It's a very hard fishing season for eagles last year. Very, very dry spring. The fish runs weren't great, and the nesting coincides with the fishing. So that was really important connotation where it was a dry spring. It was uh, not many fish going up the rivers. So it's just more information we needed to confirm things for that part of the coastline. So that's important. From this week, no animals in Spain can be transported in more than 35 degrees heat. Well, that's great news. About time to do something sensible. One of the eight Liberian lynx released in Lorca has died. And when I see stories like this, they're trying to reintroduce uh, wild animals into areas that where they no longer exist. If they don't find their prey, they end up dying, right? And we don't know if that's what happened, but that's the right way to think when you hear stories like that. You shouldn't rule it out. Let's put it that way. Chicks rescued after parents, penguins, abandoned nest after bad weather. Floods the nest. Well, penguins are good with water. In the past few days, Cape Nature and... Sand cob penguin and seabird rangers braved the cold, freezing cold, wet weather to form necessary monitoring of penguins. They went out in adver adverse conditions to rescue these little birds. So my hat goes off to them. The dedicated efforts paid off when they found 97 penguin chicks had been abandoned. Well, they usually abandon them because of other reasons. Flooded nest, which is not unusual in that environment. Wet and shivering, unable to regulate their body temperatures. And in the last two weeks, well, it can't be flooded for two weeks. There have been unfortunate fatalities. 147 penguin chicks have been successfully rescued. So it sounds like there was a starvation event and they were abandoned, which is what we're seeing with a lot of seabirds, right? Because when it's going for two weeks, you can't blame a flooding event for a two-week continuous crisis, right? And get artificial hand feeding. The team worked tirelessly to find a vessel intended for extreme weather conditions and then went out with a crew willing to venture out to the islands and rescue seven abandoned penguins. That's some serious dedication there. Because there's nothing scarier being out on the ocean in adverse conditions. And I've been there for many, many years. There's uh, tons of experience, but it, it never stops getting scary. Strong winds and rain persisted at the port where the team waited anxiously to receive the precious cargo. So they risked their lives to go out and rescue some of these birds. And they met between 24 and 28 different species each year. Obviously, this is since Fukushima. Seabirds are the key indicators of marine health and making them vital for identifying deteriorating systems. The biggest threat for the endangered species like the African penguin faces is a lack of food, resulting in emaciation. And the inability of adult birds to feed their chicks. So emaciation, folks. Threatened Mexico, Vaquita, Vaquita porpoise resist extinction. There's still a few hanging on, apparently. That's a rare picture of them. So here was Greenpeace, the she shepherd. And uh, it was, this was really interesting because you had the head of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, Watson, I guess, is it? And he was re reading a uh, pre-scripted uh, message in this interview. It was the creepiest thing I've ever heard when he done it. It was really creepy shit. So they're going to put in this huge effort to go out 
for this uh, porpoise or dolphin. Is it porpoise or dolphin? Porpoise. But here we are on the East Coast. I got a broken motor. We're trying to desperately get a handle on the species die-offs here. And I'm going out with a broken motor each day. <laughs> Just, the whole story is bad, man. And they're burning who knows how much money chasing a porpoise. And they refuse to acknowledge Fukushima at all, eh? They're 100% controlled opposition, these people. They got tons of people volunteering, tons of money, tons of support. They got an endless budget. And I, w I work on next to nothing. Just It's very difficult to, to carry out. And so every time I go out, I'm going with the skin of my teeth and in desperation to get the counts done. So I'm very grateful to even get one day in now because we've been ostracized for so long. It's estimated there were 20 or fewer vaquitas left, a uh, porpoise left in 2018, says the Sea Shepherd. So our commitment to the goal of saving the la vaquita is total for us as Sea Shepherd. And that's what he'd done in that pre-recorded speech he'd done. It was really creepy if you listen to it for us as Sea Shepherd. So they're totally dedicated to these 20 animals. Every other species can get sick and fucking die as far as they're concerned. Total commitment, he said. Non-profit, which is controlled opposition. They won't even acknowledge Fukushima happened. And they're teamed up with the Mexican government to tackle illegal fishing. Instead of advocating to save the species because of Fukushima's endless radioactive fallout, what killed thousands of fish in Onida Lake? The fish are still washing ashore. It turns out the massive die-off is still a mystery. Uh, mystery experts are actively working to solve. Because usually, I, I'm surprised you didn't try to blame it on the bird flu, actually. We literally found hundreds of dead fish, and they were all adult gizzard shed. They tend to collect the marinas, especially when you have wind blowing fish in that way. I've never heard that before, <laughs> wind blowing. Well, dead fish, I suppose, but it's not uncommon to see a handful of dead fish along the shorelines in springtime, but actually it is. Pre-Fukushima, it was like literally unheard of not common, like they're suggesting. Fish die-offs expected warmer temperatures across Michigan. May to early July is the highest number of fish kills reported. It's usually later in the year that you get the fish kills, not early. Long hot summers and everything starts drying up, not at the beginning of spring. Kashmir iconic Dale uh, Lake is dying. These are such sad stories. This is such an iconic. So they're suggesting sewage pollution encroachment and strangling one of the Earth's jewels. It is. It's a huge migratory stop too. And that non-native species could spell doom for its fragile ecosystem. I, I don't know. That's the first time I heard of that story, so I got not, I got nothing to say. I'm just covering it because it's because we care, right? Hot, hot weather may result in more dead fish in Michigan lakes and streams. Again, this is usually late in the season, not at the beginning of the season, right? Stress fish like pike, perch, suckers, bass, bluegills live in the shallow lakes or bays with excessive amounts of algae or rooted aquatic vegetations. And summer kill is usually experienced later in the summer, not at the beginning. You have to race to save the Florida mantatee. We covered that quite a bit over the last number of years. And they're spending a fortune trying to save them, about time. 
And most of it was done with donations for a number of years. And suffering from kidney failures and nine groundbreaking surgeries, physical therapy, supplemental feeding, and a variety of treatment for ailments. Like, so they were trying to save one because it had a baby that was a newborn calf that was in good shape. And so they've, they've spent a quarter million dollars on it. Manatee deaths surge among the already threatened population, mainly in the Indian River Lagoon area. An estimated 1,100 manatees died in 2021, 800 in 2022, and around, uh, that's still above the five-year average. Well, pre-Fukushima, there was no five-year average. And we showed the decline of seagrass during our research expeditions, right? How it deteriorated and started to die along with all the other species. Uh, so there's other species depending upon the seagrass too, by the way, like shrimp and fish, and they're gone too. Seagrass uh, shank shrank by 25% between Fukushima 2011 and 2021. Uh, in a report last year, the Southwest Florida Water Management District documented a loss of more than 4,000 acres in Tampa Bay, 577 acres in Sarasota Bay in 2020. As the seagrass perished, the mantises slowly starved to death, their rib cages and skulls easily discernible beneath a diminishing layer of fat. And Filter feeders, which we've seen wiped out along the coastlines, they're really important because they're, they filter the water, right? But they aggregate the radiation because they're filter feeders. So there's a lot to each of these equations. Producers have options for dealing with black vultures. So they're talking about you can, you can get a special license, shoot one and hang them to stop the rest of them from coming around your farms. Because now they're very predatory. They're attacking baby, they're very aggressive attacking baby cows, calves, and stuff like that. Because they can't find anything out in nature, they moved into the local areas. And, and they're, instead of being scavengers, they're now predators, which is not, that's not their genetic makeup. Below average dead zones expected in the Gulf of Mexico. So when you, when you get a lot of radiation fallout and it washes down on the coastlines and like the Gulf of Mexico is prime. The Gulf of Mexico got other issues over the years, of course, BP oil and other things. But you expect uh, these dead zones. And so if you look at a lot of the dead zones pre-nuclear meltdown, a lot of these are close to where they've done the dumping in the oceans of nuclear waste for uh, three decades. Because when the barrels are sinking, they're 14.7 pounds per square inch or something every 33 feet. So trying to get down to 100 feet, they implode and release the radiation immediately. It starts to get released, not 30 years later like they were claiming, right? So the hypoxia area we we have a lot of evidence that points to radioactive fallout causing the hypoxia event because the phytoplankton gets exterminated because they're at the surface right away, right? And so they're going to blame it. Some of it's true. It's going to be runoff from the coastline. But uh, post-Fukushima is when you're seeing these events escalate, not pre-Fukushima. So when, it, when you see it post-Fukushima, then you have to put Fukushima into the equation to see if that might be part of the equation. And because radioactive fallout covered the entire planet in such a short period of time, you would be remiss not to include it. Recent research showed that most of the world's ocean plankton 
could cross a threshold where instead of soaking up carbon dioxide, they start doing the opposite. Uh, like clearly, the evidence clearly shows the phytoplankton were decimated after Fukushima. And that showed up in the feeders of the phytoplankton where they got decimated. Like certain whales that feed on phytoplankton are shown up emaciated everywhere, which is like the gray whale, for instance. And they're the lungs of the ocean producing half of the world's oxygen, 50% of the world's oxygen, yeah. It's incredibly critically endangered sea stars found along the Oregon coast. These were baby sea stars, folks. Now, we, you know, because I've done six years straight, uh, four to five months on the ocean without coming home, a research along the coastline, right alongside of there in Vancouver, British Columbia to Alaska. And we only found a few species of star uh, starfish out of the 87 species, the, the, and each species comes from multiple colors, we found one sea star. It wasn't in the tidal zones. It was underwater, but we spotted it. And so they feed on, on uh, like when I was used to work underwater, there, there's amazing, like sea, when a sea star is crawling along, all the other species gets out of its way, and sea cucumbers will excrete their uh, guts, basically, if the star sea star touches them. So what I used to do, a uh, sick joke to the poor sea cucumber, I would take a starfish, a sea star, and lay it half on a sea cucumber. Because if I was going to work there for six hours, I would watch the struggle. And before it came back up, I would separate them again, right? But in that period, they would start, the uh, sea cucumber would start excreting its innards. I've done that a lot of the times because why not, right? And then, uh, but back in those days, you know, the starfish were all touching each other, and when the sea star come through, they would they would know they would clear a path for the sea star to cut through. It was amazing to see it, and then when it goes past, it would close in the gap behind it because it was normally life just constantly touching each other. And I showed you kind of pictures of that earlier, what it would look like at the very beginning, right? The Oregon Coast Aquarium is feeling a glimmer of hope after staff discovered the most sunflower sea stars in one location since those the sea star, what they call it. Now, I read the papers on this, and we've done interviews with people that were making these claims. Of the sea star wasting syndrome began decimating in populations in 2013. And, uh, you know, I hung out with the dive fleet up in uh, Haida Gwaii, the Queen, formerly known as the Queen Charlotte's, and they were reporting in real time the die-offs underwater of the sea stars. And this, because sea stars, starfish, rather, use water like we use blood, right? So to them, the ocean is their blood. And so they're very, very vulnerable to radioactive fallout, for instance. And so they found uh, around 25 baby sea stars, but not adults. Which, and, and when they show you these pictures, right, they got a bit of a bull kelp there. So why don't they show us a wide picture of what else was there? Because it was probably just that one rock. Aerial insecticide spraying in the Northeast Forest begins June the 1st for spruce budworms because the trees are destroyed because you, you destroyed the bacteria and the fungus with the radioactive fallers. They're very, very susceptible to any kind of invasions, right? But, you know, how do you say chemtrailing don't exist except for nine years in Vietnam and everywhere else? What have I got down here? I missed something. Oh, snakes in Lake Erie. Is it safe to swim? This is a weird story. Until you read it. There's a snake invasion in freshwater. 
and he said it's uh, led to a significant decline in fish populations. And others maintain that the aquatic reptiles aren't dangerous to people. I was reading that yes, this one yesterday. The summer heat becomes too much, and so the snakes go into the water to get shelter. And remember, there's a lot of birds and seagulls and pelicans and fish will eat the snakes, by the way. And that's a black rat, black rat, I think it is, snake or something. The northern water snake, western ribbon snakes, black rat snakes, uh, eastern long-nosed snakes, including timber, timber rattlesnakes and copperheads. And Lake Erie, garden snake, garter snakes, which are harmless. We're almost through. And the ancient fish everyone loves to hate, the sea lampreys. And so the sea lampreys themselves, when they go up the river, they lose their teeth. They're going up to lay eggs and die, right? And the eggs might take 10 years for them to hatch. And they're very important to the ecosystem because they break down, they feed all kinds of, and lots of predators will eat them when they're alive. Uh, but they're scary looking, right? And they've been, hate, they've been a hated fish, but they're incredibly important to the ecosystem, including their eggs. Scientists recorded the first virgin birth of a crocodile. So you got a crocodile that actually laid eggs I can't remember how many were fertile. Maybe we got it here. She had no male crocodiles for 16 years. And the uh, offsprings were born with only DNA from the mother. I think it was eight, eight of them were fertile. A black bear come ashore. This was a baby black bear. Pretty skinny looking too. That was just interesting stories. I'm not sure why. Sometimes I'll, I'm, when I see the story, I'll start recording, you know, screen captures and forget to edit it out. Uh, to restore reef dying in warmer seas, the United Arab Emirates turns to coral nurseries. So they're having some success where they're finding um, coral is broken off and they're bringing it back and they're nursing it and regrowing it and bringing it out and planting it. And they've done quite an amazing job, folks. I'm very familiar because I've got years and years and years of thousands of hours of underwater diving. So this kind of stuff appeals to me. But How warming ruined a crab fishery and hurt an Alaska town. Well, you're talking millions or billions of crabs are missing in Alaska. It's a total failure. Since 2013, two years after Fukushima, is what you would expect. A lot of radiation will end up on the ocean floor, right where the crabs are living. Uh, we don't have a smoking gun, if you will. They estimated that billions of crabs have been lost in just a few months' time. And they don't know what's going on, but uh, the, these communities were incredibly dependent upon it. And they even got some scumbag from Woods Hole, huh? degenerate mass murdering Woods Hole, piece of shit Woods Hole. In some parts of the Gulf of Alaska, surface temperatures one year after the emergence of the blob, remember the blob? This is Fukushima, this is the blob. The surface temperature was seven degrees higher than it should be. I really despise them for doing that, right? They gave it up after that first year, but the blob, so-called blob, which is the entire ocean, radiation has contaminated the entire planet. Let me explain that to you again. Because if, you, if you're not following the whole show, you're just joining us, it gets confusing, I'm pretty sure. But so the radioactive fallout doesn't just target mountains or whatever, right? It immediately, within a two-week period, it covers the whole planet. This model is based on 16 days, 
since the tsunami and nine days since the last reactor blew up. So this is the government of France's model. And so when you see this global warming, radioactive fallout is global warming, that's 80 years of these emissions. They never go away. There's always more emissions each day. And then there's these pulses. And there's a thousand fuel pools still splitting the atoms into the environment. And these shows are, we're getting through it. We're getting there. We're almost through it. Algae blooms, poisons, shellfish, krill, and forage fish numbers decline, causing whales, cods, and other predator species to shift their migratory patterns because they're emaciated. You won't see that no more. Coastal biomedical labs are bleeding more horseshoe, horseshoe crabs with little accountability. So they use the blood to test all kinds of pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. And there's no, they basically got no restrictions on them. So they, they pay people to go out and capture them and a large percentage of them will die from the bleeding, right? Because they, rather than setting up shops and doing it and releasing them back into the environment so they can survive, they bring them to a central location where they don't have any chance, basically, of surviving. And they're not really true crabs. They're along, like, spiders, ticks, and scorpions. And birds like to eat their eggs because they'll go up in the beaches to lay their eggs. And a lot of birds, migratory birds, are depending on those eggs in their migratory runs. So when the horseshoe crab blood comes in contact with a toxin, it starts to clot. And so the pharmaceutical companies have no accountability. Is kelp the next ocean hero? Only if we can protect it. Well, my research expedition showed the kelp is being exterminated along with the other species. And a lot of people denied that for many years, of course. But we can't deny it because we've done the research, we documented it. There's an endless benefit for kelp, right? Midges make a big return to Lake uh, Pancha Train, Pachar Train, I can't pronounce it, my apologies for butchering it. Nighttime drivers, and I love stories like this, but you have to wonder where are the predators, you know, when you see these big mass of insects, which are very rare these days, then where are the predators? Why aren't they taking advantage of it, right? We got frogs everywhere here, but there's no predators feeding on them, see? There's no birds. <clears throat> and it's very early in the year to see them, right? But there's usually um, a lot of frogs and swallows and other birds will eat them, but we're not seeing that in the narrative. So now they're going to try to vaccinate bees because they're going extinct. Because they're bringing back radioactive material pollen, radioactive pollen, and that's destroying the nest, right? In the United Kingdom yesterday, the biblical swarm of flies attacking popular beaches. And so a lot of this is just from my record, so we, we got a baseline to think about later. Postmortem shows polar whales were healthy. This was a couple, this was uh, yesterday. It's incredible. Why would you say something like that? We're healthy before they swam ashore and died, right? And a couple of days ago, the reports were they, they were chasing food and it got stuck, despite the fact that it was deep water, right? And that's why I hate these... Um, so-called rescue organization. Like the people that are working are good people, I'm not saying that. 
I'm just saying the ones that are controlling it created these operations. You don't have to, everybody don't have to be in on the lie for the lie to work, right? But that was an interesting statement. They were healthy. They, they were healthy, but they died. <laughs> Ruling out diseases, right? Yeah, we're almost through this. Research has sound alarm over the health of endangered endangered uh, southern resident orcas. The thirteen endangered. So this story is from yesterday, I believe. And so they're suggesting that in poor condition, which is emaciation. Yeah, so they're talking about in poor health based on measurements of fat beyond the skull, the lack of girth put the orcas at two to three times higher risk of mortality. Why not just call it what it is that they're emaciated, they're starving to and they most likely have leukemia from the bioaccumulation of radiation. Today, the dead whale washed up on, so we're almost through if we're covering today's headlines. Dead mink whale washes up in the Canadian Peninsula, which is on the other side of where the pilot whales died over the last couple of days. And that's clearly emaciated. People said they've been there for 55 years. They've never seen it before. Whales washing up dead. Two dead whales found in one in two days. A Roger Payne, a biologist, discovered that whales could sing as dead at 88. Bless his heart. Beach whale and PEI. And obviously this is a baby whale, but it's very, very emaciated. Beached. Look at his spine and look how the body, there's no fat there whatsoever, so called baby fat from the rich milk, right? So it'll gain a lot of, a lot of weight from the rich milk. And PEI is way up the interior, is way up the interior of Canada's coastline. There's a lot of fresh water coming down through that area. And uh, last month, he found a beluga <coughs> in PEI that was so deformed you couldn't tell the difference, right? Because it's already or decomposed. But if you go back to 2021, beluga visited Prince Edward Island. That's clearly emaciated. That's and it's severe emaciation. I mean, holy shit, that is severe, unbelievable emaciation. We only got uh, two stories left. El Nino, not the avian flu, caused the deaths of hundreds of birds in Mexico. That's the story from today. So here, they're, they're not going along with the avian flu. They tested the birds themselves. And instead of the avian flu, to their shock and horror, the Mexico Agricultural Department said Thursday the test on the dead birds revealed he died of starvation. Of starvation. Not the bird flu. That's from today, folks. So there is some descending voices, but everybody who sends their samples to the to the government laboratory where everybody else is sending it to, it comes back as avian flu. But if you do it yourself, it comes back as starvation. And uh, work your fingers to the bone. What do you get? Emaciated fingers. Well, that's it, I guess, for everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. These are hard shows for everybody. I know. I get it. 
And these are long shows too, right? Because you got so much scattered up. So it's two and a half hour show, so I saved it for the end of the week. This is the last show of the week. We start our shows on Thursday. I got practically no views in two and a half hours, one of the most important topics in history. Not much I can do about it, but you gotta tell the story because the story never stops rolling, right? It's every day there's another pile of documentation to cover. And because I'm pretty good at telling the story after all these years, they got no choice but to censor me because the industry can't exist with uh, even a little tiny bit of truth on the planet. It can't exist. We're going to do a shout out tonight, I guess, because it's the last show of the week. And I'm literally burnt out. There's a lot of big shows this week, a lot of documentation, absurd amount of information. And so I'm not sorry to see that it's the last day of the week for me, which is Thursdays. We do five shows a week. And there, we, have to, we have to do it, right? It's not like I got an option. We got no one to replace us. So we, we got to do even as hard as it is every time. And to keep this pace up week after week, month after month, year after year, I can tell you clearly it's not easy. But it's the right thing to do. We're, we need the other narrative into the uh, equation, and nobody is going to do it for us. So we have taken the task upon ourselves. We're going to close the poll down first. We got a dismal poll, 39 votes. Has Fukushima Global Radioactive Fallout permanently compromised the ability of the species to exist? I think that's an incredibly appropriate poll. A little heartbroken, we only got 30 likes after all that work, amazing amount of work, and then sit here for two and a half hours and diligently go through everything. And that's because the nuclear industry can't survive with the truth, right? But the, we can't survive without the truth, so... Dana Dasana, hi Dana. Uh, Albert, good night everybody. Beard Bones. Richard, uh, James Lucid. Good night everybody. Have a great weekend. Sandra Wolf. Peace, we're. I know Colette is out there somewhere. I seen Stephen Young here uh, earlier. John Shiflett, Nobby. I don't blame people for not wanting to watch these types of show, but I blame people for not wanting to watch these types of show. I don't blame anybody, you know that about me, right? I, I get it worse than most people possibly could. Kevin Marble, because I, I, I know it's a, tough, it's a tough conversation, right? But nobody else is going to have that conversation if we don't do it. And so we're trying to, we're trying to reach the policymakers and the investors in the nuclear industry and make them rethink and give them some facts for a change to work with and make them reconsider, make the world... Uh, we're trying to give the future generation a chance. We're trying to give the species that might be able to survive a chance. And they have no chance if we don't have a conversation. Don Vincent, very few people in the comment section tonight, I notice. Angel's Place, we're almost up through the comments. I worked so hard for so long and I've been censored like I don't even exist because that's what a coward does. He censor people like us, right? Good night, everybody. Hugs for everybody. I don't, there's Stephen Young. Have a nice night, Stephen. I know you're not going to have a nice night, but I'm going to say it anywhere. Cause Stephen is doing the best he can to recover from a multi-year illness 
and it's a long, difficult thing to try, but he's doing the best he can. Savannah's fourth. Jeffrey Brown, good night, everybody. Great night. Have a great weekend. We'll see everybody on Sunday at uh, regular time. And we'll start again. I'm exhausted. We'll see everybody on Sunday. As long as we're expecting an earthquake in Japan, it still hasn't happened. And we know, unfortunately, it will happen. And so if I show back up in before Sunday is typically because there was a major event. Hugs for you and your loved ones and your communities and your friends and your families and your pets. Have a great day. We'll see everybody on Sunday. Thank you, Bubbly. Good night, everybody. make it this far don't forget to give us a thumbs up we should have tons of thumbs up by now Yeah, good night, everybody. We'll see everybody on Sunday. Take care.